Day Women in Industry webinar, Ask an Executive, featuring David Kohler. Today's webinar is the first in a series of webinars and events for ASA's Women in Industry group. Earlier this year, the group held their first conference in Chicago with over 80 attendees. Future events, including another webinar scheduled for October 21st, as well as a reception during Network ASA in Las Vegas, September 9 to 11. Plan to register now for Network ASA and make your hotel reservations as rooms are going fast. More information can be found at www.asa.net. Today's webinar will be recorded and available only to ASA members at asa.net later on this week. I'd like to take um, a moment to call your attention to the ASA supplier partners, our sponsors, listed at the bottom of the slide, whose support has made investing in valuable benefits such as today's webinar possible without raising membership dues. A very special thank you to Kohler Company as a premier platinum level ASA supplier partner. With that being said, I'd like to now turn our webinar over to our moderator, Diane Early. Diane? Good afternoon. Thank you for participating in today's ASA Women in Industry Division Ask an Executive webinar with David Kohler. My name is Diane Early, and I'm with American Pipe and Supply Company, an ASA member out of Birmingham, Alabama. As a volunteer within ASA's Women in Industry Division, we are excited to bring you the first of many informative webinars that ASA's newest division will be producing over the next several months. Before we get started, we have just a couple of housekeeping items for you to remember. Mr. Kohler's presentation will be approximately 15 minutes in length. As participants will have their audio muted, we ask that everyone please use the questions button on the GoToWebinar dashboard to type in any questions that come up throughout the presentation. We will gather questions and address as many of them as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Now just a brief background on Mr. Kohler. David is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Kohler Company and is the eighth individual to serve in the role of president since the company's inception in 1873. As a member of the company's board of directors and executive committee, David oversees three of Kohler Company's four worldwide businesses, Kitchen and Bath Group, Global Power Group, and Interiors. David received his bachelor's degree in political science from Duke University and his master's degree in management from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. We are excited to have him as a presenter for our inaugural Women in Industry webinar. With that, let's get started. David, take it away. Well, thank you, Diane, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to work through a set of slides in a short presentation, and then uh, I think I'm going to answer a set of questions that you've already um, published to us to review, and then I think we'll have plenty of time if you have additional questions after that for me to go through. So that's the game plan, and uh, I'll get started. Uh, now and hopefully the technology works. Let me try it here. No, if I should be doing something different to advance this. Since Just let me get my technical expert just a second. Kaylin, how is the slides impressing the rest of the uh, Impressing the arrows and we're not working. These are supposed to. Oh, I'm oh sorry. Okay, there. got it. I'm sorry. Thanks. Of course. <laughs> Thank you, Kaylin. It did take a woman to figure this out. Thank you. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll get started. So the presentation today is really 
um, uh, brought the broader subject of, of talent and, and leadership uh, development. And certainly I'll uh, address, you know, women as part of that and, and, and specifics around that. But that's the, uh, the topic for today. Um, just kind of setting context in our company, um, our company, I think, has a, a long tradition of, of growing talent internally. That, that's really a core strategy of our company is to build talent. Uh, occasionally, we have to go to the outside, obviously, and augment our uh, internal talent. Uh, with talent that we hire from the outside. Uh, but our first and foremost strategy is always to build talent. And as my father, our chairman and, and CEO has said uh, historically, one of our greatest challenges going forward is really to build a stronger and very uh, diverse organization based on the new reality of our company being a global company and that's across many different cultures and how do we really leverage the benefits of the differences and you know the diversity that all the cultures that we work in can bring to really build the strongest organization possible and we think uh, that diversity really creates the strongest uh, organization in terms of bringing different points of views perspectives talents to the table uh, we also believe that as we work in different cultures, it's also very important to understand the uniquenesses of each culture we work in and how does our company succeed in those specific cultures. Really, if you look across our businesses, our, our, our formula for success is, is fairly similar. Uh, we're a company that's first and foremost focused on growth and continuous improvement. Um, you'll see a drive for organic growth or internal growth in all of our businesses augmented by acquisitions. Uh, but secondly, uh, you'll see a, an organization that's very focused on product, product innovation and innovating in product and service offerings. We want to be the, the best in the world in terms of delivering excellent products uh, to our end users across our different brands. We build brands. We also really focus on the end customer, the users of our brands to understand insights. We build strong distribution and, and align the distribution. We want to have strong partners for our company to build our business together. And that's what's built our company around the world. We also focus, as I said, on, on building the strongest organization possible in the in industry segments that we compete. And uh, that's a heavy emphasis uh, in our organization to attract and retain that talent. And finally, as a privately held company, we reinvest over 90% of our earnings back into the business. And that's the fuel that allows us to continue to grow and build this company over the last 140 years. So the bottom line around this is that if you look back in the last 140 years, the people of Kohler Company have built this company. And the people of Kohler Company really differentiate our business. And that's why we spend so much time in the development of our people, uh, assessments of our people, and uh, talent that we hire from the outside to really continue to strengthen the organization. This is really what we look for uh, in, in leaders uh, and talent uh, that we hire. Uh, and that we promote internally and develop uh, self-awareness. We want people uh, that understand themselves. You know, nobody is perfect. I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. And we want people that understand what their talents are, what their strengths are, what their non-talents are, what their weaknesses are, so that, you know, they can help really develop and improve the best they can, and we can help support their development. Uh, we're an organization that's about achievement and results, so you have to have a results orientation. Uh, we want people that can work in a collaborative way, uh, work across the organization collaboratively, uh, work in a team, and also as they move up in leadership, be able to build a strong, diverse team. We want people that understand their business. Uh, some people uh, in the world say details aren't important, but you know we really believe that details are important. And knowing your business and inside and out is critical. Uh, we want leaders that can inspire followership. And uh, 
leaders that, that care about their organizations and care about the people that work for them. And uh, that doesn't mean that they're not, you know, challenging and coaching and uh, occasionally, you know, uh, tough uh, as a leader. But at the end of the day, uh, a leader has to be able to inspire people to want to follow them and to work with them. And that takes a, an element of, of inspirational leadership. We also focus on leaders that can drive innovation and product process, whether that's a functional role or a, a product-centric role. We want leaders that are uh, not afraid to embrace new ways of doing things and will drive that. And leaders that have a strategic focus, not just a, a, a tactical focus, but leaders that can also set strategy for how to position their organization to succeed in the future. What I look for most uh, in people uh, across Kohler Company are really uh, four things. Uh, passion, energy, and drive are, are certainly uh, uh, a large component of what I look for, but I look for, number one, ethics and integrity. Uh, everybody at Kohler Company must possess ethics and integrity. Second, passion, energy, and drive. Uh, third, uh, the ability to deliver results. And, uh, you know, because in any position, you have to be able to deliver results. And then and fourth, people really build talent, people that can really attract and build teams. Uh, those are the four most critical things that I look for in leaders. So how we develop leaders uh, at our company um, is really based on, uh, first of all, understanding the different stages of leaders and their development uh, as leaders. So we really started to focus on talent early on and understanding who are those emerging leaders uh, in our company. Um, the people that we may have recently hired or in their early stages of their career. Um, understanding the qualities that, you know, that we talked about, those that are, are driven, motivated, uh, those that are inspiring, those that are really uh, showing the passion and energy and the drive, uh, exhibiting the standards of leadership that we would expect. These are the types of emerging leaders that we want to start to identify early and then get into leadership development programs and teach them how to effectively deliver results and tools and techniques that can help them improve in that area understand um, how we can teach them to better understand themselves and learn about themselves through a variety of techniques and uh, different self-assessments and inventories. The next stage of leaders are really uh, people leaders, those leaders that will lead teams. And uh, here we're really focused on uh, development around uh, things like their ability to engage and inspire their team. Um, development around, you know, enhancing their skills to really understand all aspects of their business and learn different functions that they may not be as experienced with. And their ability to really assess and build this, their team and, and, and uh, coaching and development around uh, coaching and creating individual development plans for the associates on their team. But those are some of the competencies that will really start to work and development, develop at that stage of leadership. And then finally, uh, executive leaders or leaders of leaders at the top of the organization. These are leaders that are, are managing uh, a broader portion of the organization. They're managing sets of functions, multiple functions or businesses. And here to really um, you know, cultivate strength leaders really have to be able to demonstrate their ability to set strategy uh, and strategic focus, not just tactical management of their function or their business, their area of responsibility, but how can they understand how to position their responsibility, their function or business to succeed in the environment ahead that they'll be facing? And how do they really continue to develop a culture of innovation and creativity and engagement in their organization um, going forward in our company. So these are the, the areas that we tend to focus on during the different stages 
of a leader's development at our company. Next, uh, I think, and probably one of the most powerful um, elements of how we develop people, um, first and foremost, we try to work with an individual to create an individual development plan. So it isn't something that just the, the manager will thrust on the individual, but it's something that the individual with the manager will work together to understand where they want to go with their career. What are their dreams and aspirations? And how can we as a company help move them through a series of steps to achieve that career goal? Um, and being honest and candid about um, their ability to do that and, and, and how we can work together and what are the critical skill or experience gaps that they have. Then once we uh, start to identify the goal and thoughts on development, our philosophy on development is around a 70-20-10 model. 70% of your development is really learning, learning by doing, learning from experience. Um, there's no better way to teach than through experiential education. And that means putting people in situations, in jobs, in roles where they grow. So I'm a product of that, you know, being put in very challenging uh, positions early in my career and learning from mentors and other people that work with me and above me and around me. Um, and that's really what we, the way we primarily look to develop our associates is putting them in challenging growth assignments because if you're put in a position that's bigger than you, you will grow to fill that position or you may not be able to achieve that. And if so, we need to off-ramp you and find a role that you can be successful. But by and large, we want to put you in challenging assignments and coach and support you to grow and learn and improve. And that's the primary way we develop people. We also look at, at projects and different things that we could give somebody to give them a growth experience like that. So learning from experience can take a variety of forms. And then 20% is really through individual uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching um, and work with uh, a professional coach or a coach or mentor inside the organization or outside the organization. We really think coaching and mentoring is important. Um, so many experienced uh, associates in our company um, and all companies can add so much value in teaching and training younger associates that we really need to avail ourselves to that great wealth of experience that exists all around us. So it's about opening our eyes to people that can help us or help others and then making the connection to seek them out. Early in my career, you know, I, I've had throughout my career many different mentors, advisors, coaches that have helped me really learn and grow and understand myself and become more and more effective throughout my career. So it's very important. And then finally, 10% is really about formal learning, e-learning, classes, you know, the classical development programs that are available inside companies or outside companies. But this is really fundamentally our approach uh, to development and it's really through individual development plans. So, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, the, the, the content of the, uh, the remarks I, I prepared, and I wanted to now go into the 10 questions that were um, asked in advance, if that's okay, Diane? Yes. Thank you very much, David. Um, our first question is, what do you see as the biggest change in the industry for women in the last five years? Well, well, first of all, I want to be clear that um, I guess my point of view isn't necessarily just about women, but, you know, the way we look at it, it it's really about, um, you know, talent and our whole organization. And, and, and women are certainly part of our organization, but I think many of the issues that we'll talk about today uh, will not only impact women, but they'll impact um, a, a broader um, you know, portion of the organization as well, and really all of us uh, in the organization. But we'll, we'll talk about some of the uniquenesses relative to that as we go forward. You know, I think um, one of the biggest changes uh, uh, 
in our industry over the next five years, and, and it's something that we've been embracing, is really technology. Um, technology is, is having and will continue to have a very significant impact on our industry. Um, and, and particularly the, the internet and information technology um, is having a dramatic Im impact. And whether you work on the product side or on the, the distribution and service side of the business, uh, technology and the internet is changing um, the availability of information. It's changing, uh, rapidly changing channels of distribution. It's changing how you interact with uh, your customer. And, uh, and how you serve them. So I think, uh, I think all leaders um, and all people uh, that work um, in the industry really have to become more conversant um, in the internet and different emerging technologies, uh, not only in information technology, but also if you look at the parallel in terms of product technology and electronics advancing um, in our industry, uh, the product side of our industry in many areas is going to continue to become more complex and more advanced. And uh, in, in many positions, you will need to be uh, conversant in that technology as well and understand how, how it works, how it can add value uh, for your customers in the supply chain. So I think, I think, uh, I think technology um, is, is probably one of the, the, the greatest um, elements of change that I'll see in my business lifetime and will continue to, next see, to see in the next five to ten years. Okay. The next question is, where do you see women in the industry in the next five years? Well, I think, um, you know, I don't have perfect data on the industry, uh, as you all may, in terms of the uh, percentage of women in the industry and in, in uh, different areas of the industry. Uh, but what I do understand relative to, to our industry and most industry in the United States is the demographic shift that's going on with the aging baby boomers and those experienced uh, associates in the U.S. workforce coming out of the workforce. And I really look at it um, for people, you know, in my demographic and younger, uh, the opportunities that will exist to continue to move in management um, are significant because there is a large number of people in our industry that will be retiring over the next decade. Um, and that's an incredible amount of experience that is coming out of the industry. Uh, but the other side of that is the opportunity that it opens up for capable people that want to and have the competencies and the skills to continue to advance. Um, so I think, the, uh, I think the good news is that there are opportunities out there that will be created through this change in the workforce um, and it's incumbent upon, you know, everyone to make sure that they're really, you know, building and developing the skills to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. Okay, our third question is for women in the plumbing industry, what three things are most critical for them to be aware of? Um, I, you know, I think, you know, again, um, I think this is uh, appropriate for women, but it's not, you know, purely just a, a gender issue. I would say, you know, most important aspect that I think about forward, one is um, clarity of who your customer is, and that, that may sound very trite, but at the core of any success in business, uh, particularly in, a, in an industry where cha channels are changing and, and there is a dynamic, um, the greatest element of success is being clear about who your customer is, your trade customer, your consumer, whoever your customer is, having absolute clarity on who that customer is, what their wants, needs, desires, 
are today, how they're changing, and how you can position your business to cater to those. And this isn't just the domain of sales or marketing. This is the, the domain of everybody in a business. If you don't understand who is paying the bills and how your function or role in the organization can cater to their success and satisfaction, then there's a problem. So I think number one is about the customer. Uh, number two, and related to that, is I really think in our industry, whether you're in the distribution side or the product side or or any element of it, uh, reality that this is a service business. Um, you know, what we're doing working together um, is to deliver service and value in the supply chain uh, to the end customer. And, you know, that means in a service business we have to deliver the most value in as efficient a manner as possible. And, you know, clarity that, you know, our success will live and die on the ability to deliver excellent service and value to the customer. And that what that means relative to how you structure and drive your, your business and your, your, uh, yourself. The third point um, is really about, um, you know, it's an individual point. You know, what are you doing to maximize the potential uh, and effectiveness and the development of yourself. Um, you know, we think that, you know, development uh, is not, you know, the company's responsibility necessarily. You know, the company has to, you know, hopefully facilitate and support that. But at the end of the day, you know, you yourself are your greatest asset um, and you're your greatest investment. So how do you develop yourself and invest in yourself uh, to really build uh, the skills, the capabilities that are going to be what uh, required for you to continue to advance and achieve, you know, the positions and the career goals that you have going forward. Okay, our next question is, what is the single most important piece of advice you would give women looking to break into this field? I think the most important thing uh, I would advise is for women to find a mentor. Um, it could be, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a female mentor, uh, you know, that would be great. Uh, but find a mentor or set of mentors that are experienced and, and they may, they work or have experience in your area of interest. You know, the most uh, valuable part of my development over the years has been, you know, really capitalizing on the amazing experience and learnings from other senior leaders at Kohler Company as well as other leaders in this industry, from our customers and other distributors and, and uh, people in the industry. I've learned a tremendous amount and also people outside the industry but in related business areas. So. Find mentors, and you'll be surprised. I was talking to uh, a very successful uh, female executive in uh, another industry uh, this week, and I, and I asked her, you know, uh, about this mentoring, and she said, you know, not enough people ask me to mentor and support them. I'd really love to do that more, and I think you'll find a great willingness, and people will be humbled that you ask. So I would, I would really focus on approaching mentors and listening, learning, ask questions, you know, all the crazy questions you think might be stupid to ask in the workplace, <laughs> you know, but, but use these resources um, to really help and guide you career-wise as well as in your own development and understanding. And then the second point would be, you know, to get involved, you know. Um, the best way to, to learn and grow is to get involved, you know, get a job, you know, in the industry or in an area that you're in, interested in in the industry, start to learn, start to grow, and start to move forward. Um, the best way I always think um, to advance in, in any career is to do a great job in the role you're in. If you do a great job in the role you're in, 
you will have opportunities by and large to advance in the company you're in. And if you don't, you know what, because you performed well in the role you're in, you can find opportunities outside your company in other companies. So really, uh, really trying to be the absolute best you can be in the role you're in. Okay, uh, David, what rules or mottos do you live by? So, uh, you know, the first one is, is really around character. I, I talked about it before, um, ethics and integrity. Um, it, you know, ethics and integrity are really the foundation of, of what we are as a company, who I am as a person, what we stand for as a brand. Um, and, you know, people want to work for people. They want to work for or, or work for companies or buy from companies that they believe um, are ethical and have integrity that they can trust. So at the foundation of everything and the way I think about, you know, business life is, is really around, you know, ethics and integrity. Um, second is really around work ethic. Um, really, you know, that's what our culture is about as a company. I mean, that's what I am and, 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 and what we stand for, you know, is really uh, around, you know, valuing work and, uh, and, and work ethic. And third is around equality. Um, we believe in the importance of the contribution of, of everybody at Cowork. And uh, everybody's equal in society as well as in our company. So values around equality. And then, uh, you know, believing in yourself. Um, you have to be your biggest fan in life. Um, growing up, you know, our parents are our biggest fans, and they continue to be. But, you know, as you get older and you'll, you, you face adversity and challenges and criticism and all sorts of things and obstacles, you know, pop up, you know, the way to pers you know, persevere through that is you have to believe in yourself. You have to try your best. You know, some days your best isn't good enough, but you have to, you know, say, you know, I'm trying my best and, uh, and, and really drive forward. And that, that will to succeed is what propels you through difficult times, as well as building a network of others that you can get energy from and support, you know, in your family as well as outside your family and friends. Uh, a second kind of rule or motto is, is to be thankful. Um, you know, it's easy to, to whine or complain or blame the world many times, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to be thankful and very thankful for what we have and the opportunities we have. And I think really uh, look within. Uh, I, I think st the strong leaders of, of any organization, whether it's a, a public organization, a nonprofit organization, a business, a religious organization, Strong leaders have a, a locus of control that's inside. And instead of blaming the world for I'm not successful because of this or this or that person, they look inside and say, what can I do to be better and more effective and control my own destiny? And that's the most important lesson is that we are all in charge of our own destiny. If we don't like our situation, you know, professionally or personally, we need to get out of that situation and, you know, pursue a situation that's going to be more acceptable or better to us. You know, we control our destiny. It doesn't matter what somebody else may say about you, although we want to be open to, you know, pot, you know, the feedback and, and uh, you know, which is a gift. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to believe in ourselves and we have to look at what we can control and how we can control our own destiny. And at the end of the day, we can control a lot as individuals and how we act and how we behave and how we develop ourselves. So that's an important learning that I've had to understand over the years. Uh, next would be really relying on, on great people. I mean, I, I think one of the greatest business lessons is, you know, it's not about just me. Uh, or any one of us, it is about the team. And the team and the organization and our company has built this company. And every day I'm amazed at the quality of the people that I sit around with in meetings that are running this company and, and driving this. We have great people and we're blessed with that. 
but it is about the power of the team, you know, working together that can achieve amazing things. And then finally, uh, one model that I, I think about or uh, kind of a rule from Sam Walton who started Walmart, um, he had a saying that I think is so true in our business um, because sometimes we make it too complicated. You know, our, our industry is very much, it's still a relationship business very much in our industry. It's a service business. It's a local business. And sometimes we get way too fancy and not understanding it, but it's all those things. And Sam used to say, when you get confused, go to the store because all the answers are there. So, so what does that mean? It means that you know all the answers are in the market. Um, they're, 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 they're there when you meet with builders or contractors or go to the counter area or the showroom area. Or, you know, all the answers are there relative to how you're serving the customers, what you can do better, what we can do to improve. You know, the customers in the market have the answers. So I think that's very true in business. Um, it really is understanding and identifying those opportunities that are out there for us to improve uh, the way we operate our businesses. So those would be the primary rules and, and models that I live by. Okay, David, our next question is, what advice do you have for women working in a male-dominated environment? Well, you know, I, I think the the, the first thing I would say is uh, to see it as an advantage. Um, you know, we could sit back and say, well, you know, that's a real disadvantage. But I would think about it as an advantage or a minimum neutral. Uh, and I know that may be counterintuitive, but um, we really don't think about it um, from the standpoint of, of gender or ethnicity. Um, we really think, and, and the way we operate is about, you know, it's about what you bring to the table. And regardless of your gender or ethnicity, um, if you're a great individual and a great performer and you can bring ideas, passion, energy, and drive to the table, um, you know, that should be respected and results. Uh, that should be respected in, in any organization. And if it's not, you know, perhaps you need to find an organization um, where it is respected. But, you know, I think if, if uh, you know, if an individual uh, can really be confident in themselves, not arrogant, but, you know, confident and assertive um, in themselves um, and really focus on how I add value to this team and this organization, I think that's most important. Um, to do in any organization, and, and it will get recognized, and you will advance. And if not there, you will find a place to do it somewhere else. Our next question is, how would you describe the culture of your organization, the relationships among colleagues, value systems, philosophies, etc.? You know, I think I've talked a, a fair amount of our, about our culture. It's based on ethics and integrity, uh, passion, energy, drive. Uh, it's achievement-oriented culture uh, around results, but in a positive way. We try to maintain an entrepreneurial spirit focused on growth uh, in our organization. Um, so those are, those are aspects um, of our organization. I think something that goes all the way back to our roots as well as respect for the individual, all individuals, all genders, ethnicities, everybody who makes up Kohler Company. You know, our company uh, was founded uh, really by an immigrant from Europe and then a whole set of immigrants that immigrated from Europe and all over the world. And now our company today is a, is a global amalgamation of ethnicities. and. Uh, it, it's a wonderful fusion of cultures, talents, perspectives, and, and that's a great element of our company because it's, it's just made uh, the depth of our resource and strength uh, so much stronger than it was. So that's really, uh, I think, you know, kind of defines our culture. I would say that, you know, no culture is perfect um, at all, and we have some strengths and we have some weaknesses, 
but I think our strengths of our culture far out, you know, out, outweigh the weaknesses of our culture. David, how did your company's culture contribute to creating an appealing work environment for women? You know, I, I think I just talked about it before um, in terms of, um, you know, not making it about gender. It's really about um, your talent, your, your, your uh, contributions, and, and really uh, it's about, you know, whoever, you know, can bring the best um, contribution to a job. Um, I will say, however, though, that because of the, the, the workforce requirements and the necessity to make sure that we have um, diversity, gender diversity, uh, and ethnic diversity in our organization, uh, we've had to make sure that we're not creating um, constraints um, that might prevent um, women um, or others from, you know, succeeding in our organization. So one thing that's come up in the last, you know, 10 years, I think, has been more flexible work schedule uh, for certain individuals who may have family requirements that need more flexibility. I think that's a reality of the workforce today and the workforce for tomorrow is the need to have flexible work rules to allow, uh, you know, to get the best talent to be able to work for the company. And, and so we have situations with, with men and women, um, you know, all over where we've had to create um, different, you know, structure, hourly structure, um, you know, ability to work from home or different things uh, to accommodate the needs of uh, a workforce where Everybody's not the same in their requirements. So I think that is important for companies to embrace that flexibility if they want to continue to attract and keep the best talent. Our next question, when Kohler has a male and female candidate, with all things being equal, how do they make a final selection? You know, it really is and always must be blind to any ethnicity, gender, or, or aspects of that nature. It must be on the merits of the individual. And, and when I think about any hiring situation, um, what I think about first is think about the position. What must be achieved? What are the top three things that that individual in the new position must do to be successful? and really drill it down to very specifics, not a vague job description, but very specific. This individual must do this in the first 12 months, and this, and this. And if you can clarify the three things the individual must do in the first 12 to 18 months to be successful, and then match those requirements against your talent options, and pick the person who has the talent and experience to deliver on those three things. I think when you do that, that helps solve the problem, you know, and find the right fit much better than, than anything else. Next question, how can a person starting out their career make it to the executive suite in a corporation? What skill sets do they need to possess and master? You know, I, I think, uh, I, you know, I, I've, I've talked about it throughout, um, you know, and, and just kind of going back over it, uh, you know, one is, is ethics and integrity. Um, you may rise to a level, but you're not going to stay there very long or, or build followership without ethics and integrity. Um, you know, followers or, or people on a team in an organization can, can see through a fraud pretty quickly somebody that doesn't care about them, somebody who's not genuine and authentic, um, you know, somebody who uh, is lying or, or you're just not presenting, you know, qualities of ethics and integrity. So number one is being a kind of a principal leader with character, ethics, and integrity. Um, that's, that's most important. And then second is, is being passionate about what you do. Um, you know, finding something you love, a, a function, an area, a, a job, a business, you know, find something that you can get passionate. Because when you're passionate, you're at your best. Uh, it's not work when you love what you do. 
um, you know, people that are passionate are much easier to manage because they're really self-driven and motivated. So, you know, finding a, a career in an area that you can be passionate about, I think, is is the second most important. Third is working hard. There is no substitute for hard work in anything, whether it's a sport or academics or business. You know, it is hard work. It is not always a bowl of cherries, and there are parts of your job you may love and parts you really don't like, but, you know, you got to do it. You have to work hard and continue to work hard. And everybody who achieves, you know, success in their life are, are people that have, have worked hard. And uh, so, so that's important. Um, you know, believing in yourself, you know, I, I said before, you know, you have to believe in yourself and look at yourself as a great investment and how can you continue to build your skill set, build your confidence, you know, not arrogance, but, but confidence in yourself to persevere and, uh, and that's critical. And then, um, you know, listening and learning, as I said before, mentors, coaches, you know, I've learned so much for people that have worked for me, around me, above me, outside matters. You know, avail yourself to all the smart people out there that can help you. And ask them, ask questions, pick their brains, uh, use them. Uh, that's a huge resource that, you know, everybody should avail themselves to uh, in the world. And then uh, finally is, is understanding the power of people. Um, it is probably the most important thing you need to do in every one of your job assignments that entails managing others is strengthening the quality of your team and getting that team to really harness their full potential and work effectively together. Um, so really understanding the importance of people uh, that work with you and peer level um, and, and, and really harnessing and, and uh, driving that full potential of that, that organization. So those would be the ma major things that I think um, would be most important in a person uh, achieving their, their career ambitions. David, as the leader of a successful global business, how do you manage work-life balance? <laughs> it's not easy. Um, but, I, you know, I think the good news is that I have uh, I have a partner in this endeavor, and that's uh, my wife, uh, Nina, and, and, you know, she has been my biggest fan and supporter uh, in my career, but she also has been very strong and clear with me, and we're very much a, a partnership in terms of our success together, and she helps me understand, you know, where the lines are and where the balance is, um, and when it you know, it sways, you know, too far in the business direction. You know, fortunately, you know, together, and I believe, you know, family is most important, and second um, is the business. Um, so it really takes discipline um, to prioritize the family and those important activities you need to be at, um, and to make choices of, you know, I can't do everything everybody would like me to do, or or do all the fun things all the time because of the family requirements. So, you know, you have to make sacrifices and, you know, and, and be selfless in many respects. I mean, there's been a lot of times in the last 30 days where I couldn't do the things I wanted to do in my free time because I have limited free time and that needs to be with the family. So, um, you know, it's about, you know, just making it a priority. Uh, but not resenting that, you know, take time that you need for yourself, but you have to make it a priority and hopefully have a partner uh, that can help you always, you know, check and discuss how, you know, you're doing against it and work together to be the best. Our next question, are there any industry or non-industry resources you rely on to grow your own business acumen, awareness, or strategic focus? You know, I, I think uh, I was lucky enough to go to uh, graduate school for an MBA, um, and, and I do encourage those who, who really have the desire um, and the interest um, to do it. There are a variety of ways, you know, to do it. Um, it
executive education will help fund that. Um, or you can take two years off and, and, and do it full time. There's a variety of different ways. Or selectively now with so much uh, e-learning available, if you didn't really have the time or, or resources or desire for a full MBA, you could be more targeted in saying, you know, finance is really an area I'm not strong in, but I think it's important relative to my career aspirations or marketing or, or sales or certain areas. And, and do a deep dive in, in finding a, a curriculum outside that could, could help you accelerate your understanding. Um, so I think some of the top resources, I've talked about mentors. You can get mentors in different skill areas, too, that you want to develop, a mentor in sales or marketing or finance. Um, outside development programs, it could be week-long seminars or, or e-learning programs. When I was uh, earlier in my career, those have, have been very important. Um, and there's even more available today than, than there ever was. Um, so I think, you know, those would be... Uh, those would be really good ones. And then reading, too. Um, you know, I was, I was accused a lot, you know, being younger, of reading, you know, lots of different things, getting a lot of different ideas. But, you know, I think reading, you know, different periodicals that you find important or enlightening or, or books uh, on the subject matter, uh, business subject matter, or areas that you're interested in, um, you know, those can be uh, helpful as well. Well, David, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and time Thank today you. for the ASA um, Thank Women you in all Industry for the opportunity. And thank you also to all of you who have joined our webinar today. Note that today's webinar has been recorded and will be available to members only of ASA and on the ASA website. Thank you again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.